Hi, I'm Dr. Philip McMillan, and thank you for joining me. I'm back. Well, for those who are not aware, I have recently been put on strike by YouTube for medical misinformation. Well, what I'm taking the opportunity of doing is updating my subscribers and my listeners as to where I'm coming from. What really has made me speak so much about autoimmunity and what really is it? So this issue about misinformation has reminded me that I need to take people back to the science because that's what's important in the pandemic. What really is the science? Now, in terms of what got me a strike or censored, it was about me talking about a paper, a preprint paper that was pulled off of a major uh, medical journal's website within 24 hours. And it had highlighted deaths with regards to the COVID vaccine. It seems as though anytime anyone speaks about this, this causes grave concern across the world. My point is simple. If it's occurring, I want to understand why, and I am particularly interested in the issues around autoimmunity. That was where I was looking, but they still considered that this was medical misinformation, and I was censored for that period of time. If you are interested in seeing what I said, which I can't say here now, you need to go to my substack, which will be in the link below. But let's come back to where we are now. I am going to explain to you again my journey with regards to research around COVID-19. The basic point is that I'm a clinician, so I happen to see patients. And at the time of the pandemic, because of research that I'd been doing previously, I took the opportunity to try and see if I could apply that approach to research in the context of COVID-19. That's as simple as it was. And that approach to research led me to the point about autoimmunity. So I'm going to take you through the steps that went there in the first place. So I started that research in February of 2020. And within a couple of months, I noticed unusual patterns about who was affected, very few children, and 76% of the cohort in China had hypertension. That stood out to me as extremely unusual. And so I started to think and research about it. Within two months, this is what happened. I had a brainstorm, a breakthrough in thinking, and I made the first documentation about COVID-19 autoimmunity. This was the 13th of April, 2020. Could autoimmunity against ACE2 be the cause of COVID-19 mortality? Okay, so this was over three years ago that I first made the connection. And you have to realize that at that time, nobody was thinking about autoimmunity. It was misinformation at that time to even suggest that when you have a viral infection. So in April, around the same time, just along with that post, which at that time I'd done on LinkedIn, I also published a short PDF. And this PDF was summarizing the theory of autoimmunity and COVID-19, you can see here April 2020, and I was just writing down some of the thoughts that I had in relation to ACE2, the ACE2 receptor. That's where it all started. And just so that you understand the principles around autoimmunity, I'll take you through a few basic things. Here I've got the virus. And the virus has on its surface multiple blue marks. And these here, these are the spike proteins. This is what the virus uses to enter the cell. It's like a key opening the lock of um, the door inside the cell. It just so happens that these spike proteins bind to ACE2. This is a cut, cut section through the virus. So ACE2 is the lock that it binds to 
to open the door to get inside the cell and then replicate thousands or millions of other viral particles to spread around the body and to everyone else. So ACE2 just happens to be a receptor and it's very important with this virus. Other viruses use other entry receptors, but this one specifically uses ACE2. So my question was at the time very simple. I had worked out that in the context of severe disease, there was a characteristic this group had free levels of ACE2 floating around. And my question was simple. Could this free ACE2, instead of the one attached to the cell, bind to the virus and get picked up by the immune system, which could then trigger an autoimmune response where the immune system starts targeting ACE2, thinking that it is a part of the virus? It's as simple as that. It's not complicated. It was a straightforward thought. Why would that not occur? And it could explain the cytokine storm. Now, it's important to grasp the concept about what really is autoimmunity, because I don't think people quite understand what that is. So I'm going to give you a simple concept. And this concept is taken from the US war in the Persian Gulf. So was a number of years ago, and essentially, the U.S. was caught in an instance of friendly fire when the American tanks were mistaking fairly harmless grenade assault from the Iraqis. They thought that this was a tank that was firing at them. In that process, six U.S. soldiers were killed, 25 were wounded, and they destroyed five M1 tanks and five Bradley fight vehicles in the process. That's what you would call autoimmunity. And it would look something like this. So this is an image here of a tank. And this tank is firing at this tank where other tanks are firing at them. And they think that this is the enemy. It's dark. There's lots of fire around. This tank is then firing back not realizing they're on the same side. That's an example of friendly fire, where the army targets its own troops. That's the principle of autoimmunity. Come back to this. In effect, what we said was happening is that the body starts to target itself instead of the virus, which leads to a cytokine storm. That's where the lungs and the kidneys and the hearts get severely damaged. And that was the premise that I started off with in April 2022. I then managed to collaborate with Professor Uha. Now, he is the top ACE2 researcher in the world in pulmonary disease. And he was very kind to work with me on this. And we published at that point, this was here. In May, May 27th, 2020, we published the first paper, COVID-19, A Theory of Autoimmunity to ACE2. That's myself and Professor Uhal. So we started off with this concept on autoimmunity very, very early. And what I therefore had the opportunity to do was to look carefully at my theory and see how that played out in terms of clinical disease. So it was no surprise to me that in June, they found in the recovery trial that steroids worked. My only concern was they should have been using higher doses. I wouldn't have been surprised that some of the drugs used for rheumatoid arthritis, which is an autoimmune disease, worked. Makes perfect sense if this is also an autoimmune disease. So the perspective of the scientific community was that, well, autoimmunity occurs in the infection, but it doesn't mean it's the primary pathophysiology. I can accept that. But after three years, you should have disproved autoimmunity if you cannot explain what is the exact mechanism of the cytokine storm. So that then leads us to where we are today. 
So I'm going to share with you another paper. And think about this a moment. I was speaking about this in April 2020 and highlighting this risk about autoimmunity. Well, guess what? Here we have a paper published in April 2023, about three years after. High risk of autoimmune diseases after COVID-19. So this was published in Nature's Review of Rheumatology, so just a few months ago, and they were looking at the fact that they're seeing lots of autoimmune conditions that have been triggered after COVID-19 infection. Well, what a surprise. This is exactly what I was saying. This is a viral-mediated autoimmune disease. It is no surprise that it triggers autoimmune responses. Well, what did they do in this study? They then took a cohort of patients. Now, again, because no one wants to consider the implications of autoimmunity, what they then did is that they looked at a pretty large cohort of over 800,000 individuals to try and identify the incidence of autoimmune conditions between January 2020 to December 2021. Now, they actually took out the vaccinated cohort because it could be a potential confounding factor. Only unvaccinated individuals were included in the analysis. Okay, so what did they find? The researchers identified that there was a 42.6% higher likelihood of acquiring autoimmune conditions three to 15 months after infection compared to the non-COVID cohort, okay? The importance of this is that it fits perfectly. If COVID-19, severe COVID-19 is an autoimmune disease, it's not surprising that you then see autoimmune responses occurring. But here is the big issue, three to 15 months autoimmunity does not appear quickly. And so therefore, anyone who is speaking about safety without long-term studies is being disingenuous. They can't know. And they can't know without looking for it. Autoimmunity is not a diagnosis that you stumble upon. For anyone who has been diagnosed with an autoimmune disease, they know it probably took them six months to a year before finally the experts would say, actually, I think you have got SLE or you've got MS or it takes a while to diagnose autoimmune diseases. And that's why I am concerned and have been from the start about could COVID vaccines trigger autoimmunity? because the mechanism with the spike protein would be almost the same. Is that misinformation? Or is just just an important scientific question? Now, there'll be my critics out there who say, no, 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 you can't speak about this without any kind of evidence. How am I supposed to get the evidence? Well, luckily for me, there are people who will be willing to do the work? So here we have a very, very important study here. And this study was done in Italy. It took a while to come. They looked at specifically de novo or new autoantibodies in healthcare workers after mRNA-based SARS-CoV-2 vaccines, a single cell center prospective study. This was a paper that I'd come across earlier, and it was published the 28th of June, 2023. So this is relatively recent. I had come up, it was received the 21st of December, 2022. It took a while for them to publish it because this is pretty important. This study, and I thank um, MC Sashi for doing this, but this study, what they did is they just asked the simple question that I said. They enrolled 155 healthcare workers. 
108 of them had received the third dose and were considered for further analysis. They took blood samples before vaccine inoculation at time zero at three months and 12 months after the first dose. And then they analyzed the samples for autoantibodies. And that's what they did. That is science. You ask the question, you don't ignore it. I cannot believe the scientific community. And listen, anyone who tells you that this kind of research is unimportant is not interested in science because science doesn't care about the politics. Science doesn't care about the financial implications. But science is purely looking for answers and critically trying to protect the health of the population who has been vaccinated. That's what science is about. So when they looked at the results, in effect, and in summary from it here, and I'll put you back to this, um, this paper here, in effect, what they found when they looked at multiple autoantibodies, they looked at not just ANA, anti-smooth muscle antibodies, anti-myeloperoxidase antibodies, anti-proteinase antibodies, anti-citrullinated peptide antibodies, and anti-phospholipid antibodies. So they did a number of antibodies, and their research suggested that with mRNA-based anti-SARS-CoV-2 vaccines, it can induce the production of anti-nuclear antibodies in 28.57% of subjects. 28.57% of the subjects would have new autoantibodies. Now, this wasn't a big study, and it's important to recognize that. What could be frightening is that if you did a bigger study, you may find it's worse. But even if that 28.57 comes down to 20%, even 15%, even 10%, even 5% across a million or a billion people getting autoimmune diseases, that is absolutely frightening. And that's exactly what my research has been about, raising awareness, trying to help us to anticipate the risks that we have, not ignoring them because it's inconvenient, facing the scientific questions, answering them in a logical, structured way, and definitely not playing a political game. I'm sorry that what I'm saying is inconvenient. I'm sorry that what I'm saying does not promote a narrative. I'm just interested in science. And at the end of the day, as a clinician, my responsibility is to advocate for my patients, not journals, not political parties, and not financial institutions, but patients the day-to-day -day people who could be getting sick, the ones that we need to find the answers for. This is where we are today. We have serious questions in front of us. This is not a time for us to step away from science for the sake of anything else. I call on all the scientists out there who may be listening. Please, let's search, find answers, protect patients. Thank you.